God wants to wash over us. He wants to to fill you up from the inside out so that your life, so that your cup is overflowing for other individuals. There are some folks, uh, there, there is, I was told this week that there was a, a couple that left our church. I know that said. They left our church because, and they'll probably be back because most folks do come back, but they left our church because we talked too much, or I talked too much about the second coming of Christ. That's what they said. Actually, what I was told was they, we talk too much about Revelation. Now, I've been asked over and over, having a Myra, to preach about Revelation. And I haven't preached on Revelation except once in 10 years. And it was a seven Sunday, uh, or maybe there was more Sundays involved, but it was about the seven churches found in Revelation 2 and 3. So I really haven't preached from Revelation. But there's a bloodline through the scripture that starts from the very beginning starts in the very first few chapters of Genesis that talks about how man has fallen and how a redeemer is coming. How there was one who was to redeem mankind who was going to come back, shed his blood, and his blood was going to be the forgiveness, the remission of sin, the atonement for our sins. And beyond that, he is going to come back and he's going to call the family together and the best things are yet to come. Now, I know that for a fact and there's everything in Scripture that talks about that. What I know about uh, Ken Pruitt, what I know about Byron McDonnell, Byron E. McDonald, that played for the Yankees in 1955. <laughs> Yankees was the name of his local baseball team here in Corsicana, but the fact was that he did play for them. I shared that yesterday in the service. You see, the, the beauty of life is not just the things that are happening in life, but these men, both of them, I can say, did, and I repeated these words in both of their services this week, they did what Paul did in his life in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Paul said, I'm about to die. Both these new men knew that their time was short. He said, I'm being poured out like a drink offering before my Lord. But I have fought the good fight, and I finished my race, and I kept the faith. And then he said these words, and I know there's a crown of righteousness awaiting me, and not only me, but all of those who long for his appearing. Now Satan doesn't mind if you're a Christian. Oh, we'd rather you not be ahead of time. But once you are, he doesn't mind if you're a Christian as long as you're not telling other people about Jesus. And as long as you're not looking forward to the reign of Christ, honestly, the second coming of Christ, if I do anything of value, it is encourage you to be ready this year to look forward to the second coming of Christ. It could very well happen this year. It could happen several years from now, but he is coming back and we are in the latter days and I know that for a fact. I can share with you more details than what I'm going to share with you this morning and I have in, in months past. What we've done on the first Sunday of each month since October and we had two Sundays or two Sundays in November or something like that that we did it. But what we've done is the first Sunday of each month we've talked about things concerning the end times and I think the Lord is blessing that and, and bringing us together, focusing our mind and, and I think that this is probably Probably the most valuable thing that I could do as a pastor is encourage you with things that say, hey, get ready because the best is yet to come. Now, so today I'm going to give you not a, a shotgun blast of, of information. I'm going to give you four specific events that are taking place. One of those that I'm going to share with you is what takes place at or when Jesus comes back. What it's going to be like, what it's going to look like. One of those is what's going to be like at after he comes back. What is this earth going to be like? I'm going to read for you a passage from Isaiah. The other two are, I'm going to share with you the terrible things that are going to take place on this earth just before he comes back. And then I'm going to share with you what we need to be doing now. And that's the last scripture. And that's the scripture found in your Bible. I mean, in your, it's in your Bible also, luckily. It's also in your bulletin. Now, coming close to this, Jesus said in John 14, 3, he said, If I go and prepare a place for you, the next words say, I will come again. If I leave this place and I don't take you with me now, I'm going to come back. Now, what I want you to do is take care of my business. Take care of the things that are eternal, the things that are important while I'm gone. So here's what it's going to look like when Jesus comes back. And I'm reading, if you want to take notes, from Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 through 16. Listen to this majestic turn, return of Jesus Christ. Revelation 19, verse 11 says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse. There's horses in heaven. 
Amen. Yeah, there you go. His rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he makes war and wages war. He's going to come back to clean up the earth is what he's going to do. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has one name written on him that no one knows but himself. He's dressed in a robe that's been dipped in blood. His name is the Word of God. The Word of God is the one who's coming back. In the beginning was the Word that became flesh. I repeat that over and over and over because it's Jesus. The armies of heaven are following him. Guess who's going to be in those armies of heaven? Mac, Ken, family members of yours, all those who long for his appearing. We'll see why in just a few moments. And by his grace, we'll be in that lot also. It says the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. The glory of God will be covering them. I don't know whether that's literal or figurative that we're going to be riding on white horses. If you are not a horse rider, you can be. And you will be, if that is literal. It may have to do with the fact that that picture of the white horse means that one is coming back to conquer. And Jesus is coming back to conquer. But the fact is that behind him are going to be all of those who are reigning with him. There's that passage that says, if we endure with him, we will reign with him in Colossians. If we endure with him, then we'll reign with him. The best truly is yet to come. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean, that bridal gown... That white raiment coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword. Remember me talking about the long sword last Sunday? That's him. This is the long sword. It's the entire, it's the full word of God. He knows it. He wrote it. It is him. And he has placed it in us. Though we only wield uh, like a pocket knife, if you would, or a short sword, he has it all. And he's going to come back and that sword is like the word coming out of his mouth to strike down the nations. He'll rule the nations with an iron scepter. Jesus is going to come back to rule the earth, to rule the nations with an iron scepter. Now, has he done that yet? No. The scripture says no. The scripture says the whole world is under the control of the evil one. It's under Satan's control right now. That's why we're strangers and aliens in this place. But Jesus is going to come back to reign on this place. Satan is going to be bound during that time. We don't even have to talk about that. You can read about it at the, at the beginning of Revelation chapter 20. He'll rule them with an iron scepter. He treads out the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Have you ever thought about that term, King of Kings? Who are the other kings? There are the sons of God waiting to be revealed. It's you. It's me by God's grace. King of Kings. He is the King, capital K. I don't know how to do that backwards. Capital K. He's the King of Kings, and that's you and I. He's the Lord of Lords, because those who are given responsibilities to reign are those other kings. Riding on those white horses, the lords who are given responsibility in the reign of God, honestly, in heaven. So the fact is that he's going to come back as King of Kings, but what will it be like on earth after Jesus comes back? Look, if you want to turn to this or write it down in Isaiah chapter 11 in your Bible. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. 1 through 10. There is no place in the Bible, and by the way, I have to apologize. I think I did it in both of the, both of the services this week. I think I said, when the lion lays down with the wolf, but that's not what the scripture says. What does the Bible say? The lion lays down with the... No, it doesn't say that either. <laughs> it says the wolf lays down with the lamb to eat. It doesn't, even, it doesn't ever say the lion lays down with the lamb. But we get that together because Jesus is the lion of Judah and he's going to come back. He was sacrificed as the lamb of God and he's going to come back to reign on this earth in that way. But when he talks about the animals, he says those predators are going to sit down and eat right next to the rabbits and the lambs. And the wolf eats with the lamb. Listen to the verses. This is where it comes from in Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah 11 verse 1 through 10. What the earth will be like during the thousand year reign of Christ. 
The scripture says in verse 1, and it's talking about Jesse, who was the daddy of King David. Jesus is going to come back reigning upon the throne of David, or what has been established because of David actually conquering Goliath, winning the battle over the greatest foe that Satan could throw, and Jesus is going to be building upon that point. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Something that people didn't see, there's going to be a growth come from that spot. The Spirit of the Lord will rest Rest on him, talking about Christ. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Verse 3 says of Isaiah 11, And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but he'll judge with righteousness, with purity and justice. He will judge the needy, with justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. It sounds like this time when he said, you know those who are least on the earth, those that make themselves the servants, not having to do with how much money they have, but having to do with what's going on in their heart and the way they serve. Those that are the least on this earth are going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And he that makes himself puffed up in the greatest on this earth is going to be the least in the kingdom of heaven says, this Messiah, Christ, will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. You see, that's the way he's coming back. But during that thousand year reign, verse 6 says, the wolf will live or lie down with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. Any smart goat would not lie down with a leopard right now. The leopard said, Hey goat, you want to come over for supper? <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't do that now because they'd eat them. The leopard will lie down with the goat and the calf and the lion and the yearling will lie down together and a little child will lead them. Come on, Mr. Lion. It will not be illegal anymore in New York to take a selfie with a tiger. <laughs> During the thousand year reign of Christ. Because they're not going to eat you then. The children will lead them around. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like an ox. The lion is not going to be a predator anymore. He wasn't that way in the beginning. If you go back and you read Genesis chapter 1. You will find that all of the animals. All of the animals that God made. Were made to feed just like mankind was uh, originally uh, set up. To eat off of the fruit bearing trees. And the plants that bore fruit of the land. All of the animals, all of the animals, including the lion. They weren't predators back then. You see, something happened in between God's perfection of this world and where the world is today. And that is sin came into the world and everything got messed up. Everything got messed up from the animals to the people. And this world started a, a decaying, degrading process. But Jesus is going to restore it to what it was in the beginning. Let me read that again. The lion will eat straw like an ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den. And you won't pull them back because there's not going to be a problem. Oh, it will give me the willies. But it won't be a problem because it says the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest and not even get bit. This is what it's going to be like during the thousand year reign of Christ. This is what it was like in the Garden of Eden in the very beginning. This is what it was like in the Garden of Eden. Come in close. He's just playing. Listen, they will neither harm. Those serpents will neither harm nor destroy. How many of you looking forward to picking up those snakes during that time? No, no. I don't care if they are walking sticks. I am not picking one up, Moses. They will neither harm nor destroy on my holy mountain. And the holy mountain of the Lord is going to come to this place. I love that. You can read about that in Hebrews chapter 12. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. See, during the thousand year reign of Christ, this world will be like it was in the beginning. Because God created something for mankind and God does not take back his promises. Oh, this world has fallen and he had to buy it back with the death of his son and the blood that was shed on the cross. But the 
fact is, the rest that's yet to come, the thousand year reign of Christ, the seventh day, the rest, that was the seventh day in the beginning, there's a seventh day, and a day to the Lord is a thousand years, and the thousand year reign of Christ is the seventh day. It's the rest that's yet to come. The se- you know, he rested on the seventh day, he's going to rest again. What did God do when he rested on the seventh day in the beginning? I don't know. But he didn't leave the world in chaos during that time. The scripture says God is going to step away from somehow his throne. I don't know how he's going to do this. And Jesus is going to step upon his throne. And during the seventh day, the thousand year reign of Christ, the creative aspect of God is going to reign over all. And it's during that time, probably like it was in the beginning, that Christ um, takes a role that that he hasn't been taking even since this time. Because he's going to be king of kings. See, he's seated at the right hand of his father's throne right now. One day he'll seat upon that throne. The last verse says, In that day the root of Jesse, the Messiah, will stand as a banner for the people. The nations will rally to him and his resting place will be glorious. And you can be there by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So what is it going to be like just before this? See, God gives us a scriptural forewarnings throughout the scripture of about when heaven's paradise is to come. And that's the heaven basically coming down to earth or paradise coming down to earth. Yes, the end times prophecy is peppered throughout the scripture. So I want to take you to Matthew chapter 24 and read one more time for you some scriptures from Matthew chapter 24. This is what is... See, we talked about what it's going to be like when Jesus comes... We talked about what it's going to be like after he comes. This is what it's going to be like on earth before he comes. Now, the title that I put in your bulletin, where did, where's the bulletin? The title I put in your bulletin today is the end times. And I'm talking about the end times of the earth. And I put Satan's paradise. What does paradise mean in the Bible? It means heaven. Satan's heaven is going to be on this earth during that time. Because there's one who is giving him limited power who is going to be removed from this place. And Satan is going to break loose with the terror of the ages. It's going to be hell on earth during the seven year tribulation. Man, it's like seeing a a pendulum swing back and forth with our emotions if we think about these things. But I'm going to share with you what it's going to be like from Matthew chapter 24 starting in verse 3 when the Lord comes back. See, the disciples came to Jesus in verse 3 of Matthew 24 and they said, Tell us, they said, when is this second coming? When is this going to happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered, Watch out. Watch out. Keep watch. That no one deceives you. Because see, Satan is going to try to deceive you. He's going to be good at it. Now the things we're going to talk about right here are the things that are going to happen during the tribulation. During the seven year tribulation. For many will come in my name claiming that I am the Messiah and they will deceive many people. Verse 11 says, Many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Oh, there have been false prophets, if you would, on the land in between here and back then. False prophets have been on the land. But there are no false prophets on the land today that have the ability that those false prophets will have during the seven-year tribulation. It's going to be like they are like Jesus. They're going to have the ability to do miracles. We're not seeing people at their discretion be able to do miracles. Or they would be doing them and they'd be swaying the, the, the nations. But during that day there will be. Verse 14 says, But this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. The end of the earth. Well, the end of the earth with mankind in it as we know it. Because that day that I just talked about is what is next in, this, uh, in, the, in the timeline. Verse 15 says, so what is it going to be like during the seven year tribulation when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation. This is in the middle of the seven years. You can read about it in Revelation. How down the middle of that time there's going to be one who has, who has swayed the world toward him and then he stands in the temple that will have been restored. He'll stand in the temple and he will say, I am God. If anybody says uh, you are not God, they will be murdered. They will be killed. Their heads will be cut off. Mm. 
This gospel of the kingdom, however, will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Then the end will come. When you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken about through the prophet Daniel, let this reader understand. Run, people, run. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. How dreadful, verse 19 says, it will be in those days for the pregnant women and the nursing mothers. You see, this is during the seven-year tribulation. Can you imagine not accepting Christ, being pregnant with a child... The trumpet of the Lord sounds and the church is taken up. They are being prepared at the bridal banquet. They're being prepared at the judgment seat of Christ. We're given those white horses and the responsibilities to reign. We're going to come back with Christ that I talked about earlier. And you're on earth with a baby in your belly. And Satan has claimed himself to be God. And the world is in utter chaos because there has been one who's been holding back the strength or the power or the abilities of Satan. And that one is removed. I'll tell you why in a moment. How dreadful it will be in those days. Verse 19 of Matthew 24 says, For pregnant and nursing mothers, pray that your flight, where you're running for your life, will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. Now why on the Sabbath during that time? Because the old covenant is going to be restored. Let me throw one thing to the side for you here. During the 2,000 years from God's covenant made with Abraham until the return of Christ, it was short of the 2,000 years by seven years. It was short by only seven years. And that seven years that it was short by is going to be restored. You see, this 2,000 years from Christ's birth until now is going to be a complete 2,000 years from his, from actually not his birth, but from the, the tearing of the temple, uh, the temple veil. So from the Holy Spirit leaving the temple and our bodies becoming the temple of the Holy Spirit, there'll be 2,000 years. But during that 2,000 years, they were seven years short. During the seven-year tribulation... We are going to be taken out of this earth because there can't be many temples on the earth during that time because the Holy Spirit is going to be established back in the temple. The old covenant is going to be reestablished and the Sabbath day is to be kept holy under the laws of the old covenant. Those that um, are trying to flee from the Lord during the Sabbath day are going to be, or not free, free, flee from the Lord, but free, flee from Satan during the Sabbath day are going to be breaking the old covenant because the old covenant is going to be restored during that time. I hope that's clear. Don't choke on those things. But the fact is that uh, Jesus lived for only 33 years instead of a total of 40 years like all of the other kings, David, Solomon, all of the other kings and the uh, prophets reigning or living for 40 years. He only lived for 33 years because his last seven years is going to be dealing and preparing us. That seven years is significant. All right. Let's go back to the scripture here. During that time... For the pregnant mothers and the nursing mothers, pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath because the old law will be back into effect. For then there will be great distress unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened somehow. At that time, if anyone says to you, here's the Messiah, there he is, don't believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear. They will perform great signs and wonders, literally miracles, if possible, to deceive even the elect. Verse 25 says, see, I've told you ahead of time. I'm warning you. So if anyone tells you there's the Messiah out there in the wilderness, don't go out. Here he is in the inner rooms. Don't believe it. This is the way the Messiah is going to come back. Verse 27 says, for as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the West. <laughs> so it will be when the coming of the Son of Man returns in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye. Verse 29 says, immediately after the distress of those seven years, the sun is going to be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky. The heavenly bodies will shake and then will appear, in verse 30, the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. When they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and glory... And he will send his angels out with a loud trumpet call. They'll gather his elect from the four winds and from the ends of the earth, from one end to the other. This is how it's going to take place. That's the, uh, the order and the terror that's going to be on the earth. You see, just prior to that seven-year tribulation, 
First Thessalonians chapter 4 says the trumpet of the Lord is going to sound and the Lord is going to come back. I read those verses in the last, uh, I read them in almost every funeral. The beauty of, of the passage of 1 Thessalonians 4 talks about the, the power of the coming of the Lord. I want you to hear this one more time. Today I'm just giving you some pieces that you're going to carry as, as footprints like, like, uh, like stepping stones or pads through a... Through a troubled waters that you can walk on through 2015. First Thessalonians 4 says, Brothers, I don't want you to be ignorant about those who have died or fallen asleep or grieved like the rest of the people who have no hope. If you don't know Christ, if they don't know Christ, there is no hope of the future. But in Christ we have hope. So we know that Jesus died and rose again. So we know that God will bring with Jesus all of those who have fallen asleep in him. God is going to bring back with Jesus those who have passed away. They're going to come back with him, but they're not going to come all the way to the earth. Listen to this. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive uh, will, and who are left at the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who've fallen asleep. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. See, he's going to bring back with him all of those who've fallen asleep. So, so everybody, all of your loved ones who have known Jesus are going to be coming back with him. They're going to be floating up there in the air somehow. It says, then their bodies will be taken up first, then we who are alive. After that, we who are alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. And we can encourage each other with these words. Now, is this the second return of Christ? The answer would be no. It's not the second return return of Christ. It's him because he didn't return to the earth. He only came halfway between our house and his house and he took us home to be with him. He didn't come back to the earth yet. It's not until the end of the seven year tribulation that he'll come back and put his feet on the earth. During that terrible time of that uh, Daniel 70th week or the seven year tribulation that it talks about, we will not be here if we have accepted Christ as our savior. I know that from God's word. So today's scripture, the last scripture I'm going to read for you, is found in your bulletin today. All of that was introductory, but this will not take as long as all of those things together. Today's scripture deals with, though we talked about the tribulation time, the return of Christ, what it's going to be like after he comes back, this scripture tells us how we are to be today. How are you to live through 2015? How are you to prepare your life? How are you to prepare your home? How are you to trust God to be the protector? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. How are you trusting? How are you walking? Are you putting your faith in the Lord at all? Are you going to be trusting in, in your own abilities through this time? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1 through 17 says these words. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus and our being gathered to him, as we've talked about all morning, our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, don't become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us. Now, Paul was talking about something that has taken place. He said, whether by prophecy, by word of mouth, or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come, he said, there are some people who have allegedly said, hey, Jesus already came. There are some people who have said this today, and there are millions of people who have followed. Maybe hundreds of thousands. I'm not sure how many are in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They say Jesus Christ came back already. And he shared a message that didn't take place. Jesus hasn't come back yet because I told you from the scripture the way he's going to come back and it hasn't happened yet. Paul said don't believe those things and there was, must have been some kind of letter or some kind of rumors that the church at Thessalonica had been told also. Paul said don't believe those things that the day of the Lord has already come. Verse 3 says don't let anyone deceive you in any way for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs. Remember Jesus can't come back until the rebellion of the lawless one who is Satan establishes him himself in the, in the holy place, which is going to be the temple that will be established during the seven year tribulation. It hasn't taken place yet. There haven't been miracles at the discretion of man. There hasn't been one who is likened to what we would call an antichrist. Hmm. Don't let anyone deceive you, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the lawless man has been revealed, which Satan hasn't been revealed, the man doomed to destruction. How many of you have seen Satan? I know it was your first wife, <laughs> husband, whatever, I don't know. <laughs> I never heard about him, but I never dreamed he'd have blue eyes and blue jeans. <laughs> 
Uh, no, that's not true. Um, what I know is Satan has not been revealed yet. He is still hiding in the shadows. He is like a, a, a um, poisonous gas that runs low across this earth. And as soon as somebody breathes him in, he takes their life. He is so insidious that he works in the midst of things that you never expected. And he can deceive the greatest, smartest, most wise individuals that this world has ever known, the scriptures tells us. All of creation is waiting for the man of rebellion to be uh, revealed because we know then Christ is going to come back and we can even count the days. The scripture says in the, during the tribulation you can count the days. Now about the return of Christ for his church, halfway between here and there, there's no way. No man knows the day or the hour. But about those days, once Jesus comes back for his church, count those days. It'll be exactly seven years with 30 day, uh, 360 day years as it was under the old covenant. 30 day month as those lunar months are, are counted. This man of lawlessness will oppose, verse 4 says, will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or worshipped. That's what Satan did in the beginning. So that everything, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. I already told you about that. Paul said in verse 5, don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? Well, nothing has changed. We're still waiting. Nothing has changed for them in that day and nothing has changed for us in this day. And now you know what is holding him back. What is holding Satan back so that he may be revealed at the proper time? There is one or something that is holding him back. The fact is Satan is not revealed to us now, but the time will come when he plainly is seen, understood, and then claims himself to be God. Verse 7 says, for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. It's at work in you and me, by the way. That's the, the work of Satan and the sin that, that tempts us. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until that one is taken out of the way. The last rabbit trail I'm going to take you to explains who the one is. Now I can tell you that, but I want to show it to you in a type that's given to us. I'm looking back at Genesis chapter 24. In Genesis 22, there was a time, and I've shared with you these things often, but these are staples in the Word of God, that Abraham, who was a picture of God according to Revelation or Hebrews 11, Abraham, who was a picture of God, God was told, take your one and only son, who was a picture of Christ. Take Isaac, take him up on a mountain, and I want you to kill him on that mountain. I want you to sacrifice him on that mountain. I want you to take a, a knife to kill him with. I want him to carry the wood up the mountain. There will be a donkey there that will go halfway up the mountain with that wood, then put the wood on his back and let him carry it up that mountain. Take two witnesses with you, and they will watch from afar as you sacrifice your son. Abraham thought, how can I kill my only son, but how can I not be obedient to God? And he took his son, his only son, and he took that donkey, just like Jesus riding into Jerusalem uh, with, with, on a donkey to reveal himself as a sacrificial lamb, if you would. It was Jesus who was beaten on our behalf, who the wood that was going to be for his sacrifice was placed upon his back, just like it was Isaac's back. You see, that mountain that Isaac was carrying that wood for a sacrificial altar was the same mountain that Jesus was going to be crucified on 2,000 years later in the Moriah region, in the Mount Moriah. It's the same mountain that, that, uh, that David took Goliath's head to called Golgotha, the place of the skull. It's the same mountain. All of these things were converging on throughout God's scripture. And as the details converge there, we see a picture of Abraham, picture of God, Isaac, who was to be sacrificed on that mountain, and just before Abraham, out of obedience, went to sacrifice his son, God said, wait, there's a ram over here. There's a full-grown lamb, male lamb, that's going to die in his place. And that full-grown male lamb was a picture of Jesus Christ, who was a full-grown man, a full-grown lamb of God to be sacrificed on behalf of you and I. Well, the picture in Genesis 22 says Abraham met with the two servants who, by the way, were a picture of like maybe those two witnesses that were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration or possibly the two thieves that were on the cross that were next to Jesus. The fact is that two has to do with witnesses and those witnesses tell us that this was a fact. Abraham and Isaac didn't make it up. But it's scripture talks about Isaac staying on the mountain and Abraham coming down. Now Abraham then said as his wife was set aside because she 
she died, her name was Sarah, he said, we need a, a lady in the house. We need a wife for my son Isaac. Now Isaac isn't even in the picture. It's like he stayed up on the mountain. We need a wife for my, my son. So he called his chief servant, who was named Eleazar, and the name we find earlier in Exodus, his chief, or in Genesis, his chief servant was called together, and as his chief servant was called together, he was given a responsibility to go find a bride for his son. Now, we talk about meeting Jesus as our Savior. I have accepted Christ as my Savior. I know Jesus as my Lord, but I haven't seen him either personally. I, he's only been revealed to me from the inside, but there is one who was like him who has been given to me that gives me complete knowledge from the inside out of Jesus Christ, and that is the chief servant in God's household, the Holy Spirit. He has called me out to be part of the bride of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the chief servant who is calling out a bride across this world for the Son of God. Well, that chief servant, let me read for you what took place in Genesis 24. That chief servant found this girl who was named Rebecca. She was a virgin and she was beautiful. And he said, would you be the bride? And she, he found her because she was one who was willing to serve, by the way. She had a servant heart. And she uh, took care of, of feeding him and his animals, preparing water for them. He said, would you be the bride of my master's son? And she said, I would. She was given a ring then, just like you're given a ring when you get married. Oh, she was preparing for a bridal banquet and, and for a reunion, a union with the son who was going to be later seen as the son of God. But we haven't seen Isaac yet. He's still sitting up on the mountain somewhere, or at least in picture, we don't see him in place. But then the chief servant gets Rebecca and he starts heading towards Isaac's house. Isaac leaves his house and he starts coming down from the spiritual figurative mountain and he meets them halfway between his house and hers, her house just like Jesus is going to meet us halfway between our house and his house. Take us home because Sarah or Israel, the wife of God, has been set aside and the bride of Christ is going to take that role or that place in heaven. This is the way it says it in Genesis 24. So the servant, like Holy Spirit, took Re Rebekah, like the bride of Christ or the Christians, and he left. Now Isaac had come from Ber Lohi Roi. I, I don't know how to say those words. He came from this little town that, that is named Beer. And he was living in Negev. He went out to the field one day to meditate. It's like he left his house, went to the field to meditate. And as he looked up, he saw camels approaching. He saw this beautiful lady named Rebecca. Rebecca also looked up and she saw Isaac and she got down from her camel. I will apologize ahead of time for saying this, but you don't get down from a camel, you get down from a duck. Down is that really soft feathers that come underneath the duck's <laughs> wings. <laughs> I apologized ahead of time. Duck down, that's what they put in the pillows and then, the, okay. She got off of her camel the King James Version literally says, and people have thought this had to do with smoking for years, she lighted off a camel. But that's not what took place. She, she, I'm sorry, I, I knew that was coming and I love this passage. Isaac, Jesus, came from his house. Rebecca, the church, came from her house and they met halfway. Who is that man in the field coming to see us? We will see Jesus face to face. What does he look like? We will see him for the first time then. He is my master, the servant answered. The Holy Spirit, see the Holy Spirit had taken Rebecca. Eleazar had taken Rebecca to meet the bridegroom. The Holy Spirit is going to be with us, taking us. He's leaving the earth with the bride of Christ. The Holy Spirit is going to leave the earth and this world is going to be in shambles because he has been holding back, limiting Satan's ability all this time. And Satan is going to have free reign because the Holy One, the Righteous One, is going to be taken out of the way. The one who's been holding him back. 
Hmm. She took her veil and she covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac all that he had done. The servant, the Holy Spirit, tells the Son of God, look at all the folks who've come. Isaac brought her into his tent of his mother Sarah, taking that place, that role in glory, and he married Rebekah. So she became his wife and he loved her as Christ will love us. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death or the separation of that that was supposed to be the, the chosen ones of God who was the Israelite people, forfeiting that, still having an opportunity to be children of God. I'm going to finish these scriptures by going back now to 2 Thessalonians. I wanted you to understand that. Verse 7, in your bulletin there. The secret, the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who holds it back, Eleazar, the Holy Spirit, will continue to do so until he's taken out of the way because he goes to take the bride to be with the son. And then the lawless one will be revealed on the earth during that seven year tribulation. The Holy Spirit's out of here. We are out of here and hell breaks loose on the earth. And then the lawless one will, will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow when he comes back with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Jesus is going to be like turning on the light and darkness flees when the light who, who is Jesus Christ the son of God is flips that switch and he comes back darkness will have to flee and that's what it's going to be like the Lord will overthrow and destroy by the splendor of his coming like the light being turned on Verse 9 and 10, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. I read those for you again in Matthew 24 that says it again. And all the wickedness that deceives those who are perishing, the devil will deceive by imitating Christ during that time. There are no new to tools that Satan will use then, and there's no new tools that he uses right now. The fact is, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Since the beginning of the world, the same things have caused men to stumble and women. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. There are no new sins. If you think you have more trouble than any other man, uh, you're in good company, because I have the same battles that you have, if you think that you have uh, struggles or, or pressures that no other woman has ever faced, good news or bad news, you're not unique. The fact is, Satan throws everything he can at everybody, and we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. That, that shakes me. By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of his covenant, this is what will walk us through 2015. But people who don't receive this, verse 10 says they perish. Why? Because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way. I'm the truth. They reject Jesus. I'm the truth and I'm the life. And no one will come to the Father except through me. Verse 11 of 2 Thessalonians 2 says, For this reason, God sends a powerful delusion, Satan, during that tribulation, so that they will believe the lie, and so that all will be condemned who have not believed in the truth. Again, the truth is Jesus. But those people delight in wickedness instead of in the truth. Now, the last verses here are disjunctive, which means they're separated from. But this is how you ought to live. And these are the closing thoughts. But we ought to. We are obliged to. We owe it. We ought to always thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord. You're not lost. You're family. Because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through a process called sanctification, through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, becoming more and more like Jesus throughout our life, through belief in the truth, starting with Christ, and then continuing as we become more and more like Jesus. He called you to this through, the, through our gospel, Paul said in verse 14, that you might share in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm, stand firm, stand firm. Hold fast to the teachings that we passed on to you by word of mouth or by letter. Hold fast to the word that's been given to you. Don't add anything to this word or take anything away from it. Revelation 22, it says, if you add to the word of God or if you leave something out of the word of God, there's not good things yet to come. There's accountability for that. It doesn't mean you're not a child of God. It means you're a stupid child of God. I'm sorry. Don't use that word. That was funny. Way. It means that you're not smart. It means you're doing things that are dumb. Listen, if I left out 
the fact that Jesus is coming back and I should prepare you and the Lord has prompted me to prepare you monthly on the first Sunday of every month to tell you the glory of what is to come. If I left this out, like some churches leave out accountability to God or some pastors may leave out these details because it's just not comfortable. Revelation 22 would apply to me. If anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person his share, his, his inheritance in the holy city. And in the tree of life, he who testifies to these things tells us, don't take anything away, don't add anything to it. And Jesus said, the last words found in the Bible in Revelation 22 says, yes, I'm coming soon. Behold, I come quickly. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. Even so, Lord Jesus, we're ready. We're ready. We would like a little more time. But if you're ready to come back, we're ready. We've got to be ready. The last two verses say, May our Lord Jesus Christ himself, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, May our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and God our Father who loved us by his grace, and gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, may they encourage your hearts through 2015 and strengthen you in every good deed or word. Now listen, Satan knows his time is limited and he wants to destroy you. He wants to make you suffer forever. And if he can cause you to get your eyes off the things to come, including the second coming of Christ, and be busy in 2015 with anything and everything else, then he'll be effective in, in causing you to forfeit in those eternal things to come. The only weapon that you have in 2015 to stand against the wiles of the devil is the sword of the Spirit. You can read about that in Ephesians 6. The uh, full armor of God is all defensive things, all defensive parts, but the sword your offensive weapon is the Word of God. You've got to know this. If you don't get to know this Word, then you are, you're, you're just not taking the tools with you. It'd be like going to a gunfight with a pocket knife. It's just not smart. We have the ability to fight against all of the attacks of Satan. And we have the ability because we carry the sword of the Spirit. Literally, the words of God. The Word, which is Jesus Christ in this book. And you've got to hold on to that or you will be deceived this year and you will fall away this year. According to God's timeline in the scripture in 2 Peter chapter 3 that talks about a day to the Lord being like a thousand years that I talked about from the beginning of the earth till the end. The taking up of the bride of Christ is coming real soon. We're rapidly approaching the seven year tribulation. I completely believe, completely believe that we will not be here during that time because of the things that I've shared with you and there are more evidences of that. But if you've never accepted Christ, you will experience hell on earth because that promised land, that heaven, when the lion lays down to eat next to, not to eat the kid, the goat, it's a name, name, but to eat with the goat, and when the children can put their hands around the viper's nest and not get bitten, that all is after Jesus comes back. Hell will be on the earth during the seven-year tribulation. If you've never accepted Christ, you have to. But the return of Christ is for all of us who have put our faith in Christ. He actually is going to take care of everything. How many of you come in on Sunday morning, and this is a, a simple, silly illustration. How many of you come in on Sunday morning going, well, I hope I can get through those songs. I hope that, I hope that we can, I hope all the chords are right, and I hope the chorus is fit together, and I, I, hope, I hope the preaching, I hope I can get through the preaching. I know you say that probably, but you don't worry about those things. You come to receive on Sunday morning. And I take care of and I pray through and I worry about those things because that's my responsibility so that you can receive, so you can be equipped, so that you can be blessed. I will have no responsibilities in those things in glory except what Jesus has for me. I'm not setting the agenda. I, have, I, have, I don't have to worry about sitting on committees to say, are we going to make sure this is taking place and that's taking place? I don't have to worry about pulling strings or anything. I'm going to get to receive and you're going to get to receive. But he has put us on one team that we have to be faithful to. Mac was faithful to that. Ken was faithful to that. And you must be faithful in 2015 because you've been placed on the invitations committee to make sure that no one is left behind. Benny, you're not going to be able to take those medals into glory with you. <laughs> Say it again. What you got? They're gone. And they didn't represent nothing good. They represent something that I killed. 
Yeah. And now all the metals is gone. I take a different look at them. Yeah. And they're not here as part as they was a year ago. But I found out one thing from all of this. Uh, Tuesday night, I had to make a go. Mm hmm. You, can y'all hear him? Here, let me let me grab a microphone for you. I want I want y'all to hear this. I had to make a choice Tuesday night. To where was I going to get mad, and kick the table, and throw a fit and cuss and say, "Well, I'm going to go." Uh, kill these people, you know, do all of this, and my daughter Dorothy, we, the police, we called the sheriff's department, and they said, don't touch nothing, don't do nothing, till we get there. So we sat down, and my daughter Deborah and her husband was on the way out there, and Dorothy said, Daddy, this would be a good time to pray. Mm -hmm. And I found out in 10 minutes, where I was going to stay in the good Lord batter box or I was going to hell. <laughs> and I just had a short time to make up my mind. And I made up my mind I was going to stay with the good Lord and wherever he takes me, that's where I'm willing to go. Beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. See, Benny lost something that represented something that was very important to him, and that was the victory over the, the, the hell of World War II. Some of you have lost things uh, that were even more precious than that. And some of you have children who are not with you today. Some of you have parents who've gone on to the other side, and it's tough to walk through those things. Some of you uh, have maybe lost a whole lot of money or your house or your lands. Some of you lost material things. None of those things honestly matter except the people. And here's why. There's only one thing that you can take with you into glory. And it's not medals. And it's not houses. It's not a checkbook. It's not how big your muscles are or how, how small your muscles are. <laughs> what you take into glory are people. That's why you're on the invitations committee. Benny, when he had an opportunity over about five to six hours to talk to at least four different television stations, told them about you. He told them about his Lord. He told them about his church. He told them about his family. He, he told them about the things that are eternal and the perspective, though we go through grief when we lose and, and hurt through things, and we will go through some grief and hurt in 2015, we will not be, even though we're pressed down, we will not be defeated because the Lord is going to carry us through those things. Because why? Even though we have to fight a good fight, even though some will finish their race, we're going to keep the faith and we'll know that there's a crown of righteousness awaiting us and all those who long for his appearing. There's nothing better and there's nothing else that matters. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for these beautiful folks, for the joy to get to stand today on your behalf to share the words of what is yet to come. I didn't put much, I put a little silly in there, I guess, in one or two places, but I didn't put much of my own commentary in there. Today, I just shared your word. What it will be like. Oh, those, those days to come from Isaiah chapter 11 sound sweet. It sounds so amazing and beautiful. There will be animals in heaven, won't there? There will be animals during the thousand year reign of Christ. You described them right there. Not just horses, but others. Lord, I pray that you will allow us to look forward to the important things and to make sure that no one is left behind, that everybody knows Jesus, and Lord, that, that we realize that we've got to keep our foundation on the rock that will never leave us or forsake us, the foundation that is laid in Jesus Christ. For these beautiful people, I thank you. And for this long time that I talked to them today, I'm glad the Cowboys don't play at noon. They get to play at 3.30. I don't know if you care about that, Lord, but uh, we do. <laughs> We're looking forward to this day in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you go.